love Sky Zone because it's the most fun. I love Sky Zone because it is the greatest workout. I can jump off the walls and fly with my friends. Most fun. It gets my heart rate pumping. It tones all my muscles. You can burn a thousand calories an hour. Most fun. Greatest workout. Most fun. Greatest workout. Most fun. Greatest workout. Jump into fun and fitness at Sky Zone, the original indoor trampoline park. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a wonderful spring evening. Uh, tough to be inside uh, when the weather starts breaking, and, and tonight is certainly one of those nights where it's awfully special. We're very excited tonight to be offering something a little bit different in Westlake. Uh, last year, we did a State of the Schools over at Parkside that uh, w was, was a, a nice event, a good chance for us to get our information out. Uh, and shortly after that event, which was in January last year, we then came, I then attended the Mayor's State of the City uh, a few weeks later. And, and as we went through that, and, and as we continue to talk throughout the school year and, and calendar year, honestly, it became, we started some discussions about doing this as a joint operation and having all the information available uh, for folks here in, in one setting. So, Mayor, thank you for agreeing to come in tonight. The introductions, uh, we do have some city uh, personnel here. We have uh, city council represented by Linda Apple, uh, <laughs> pulling double duty. We do have some of our board members here also. Uh, we have Barb Blazinski and John Finucan, Carol Winter and Joe Kraft has moved. There's Joe, okay. But I'd also like to take this opportunity to make a special introduction uh, to Mr. Scott Goggin, who is attending tonight. Scott is here with his family. Welcome, Mr. Goggin. <laughs> Without further ado, we will move into the first part of our <coughs> states tonight, and that will be the State of the City by Mayor Dennis Clough. Thank you, Jeff. I'm not used to having everyone sit so far back. It's not even Easter yet. It's not even Easter Sunday yet. But anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to um, present my State of the City address uh, for the second time this year. Uh, this is actually my 31st State of the City address. Um, I've been doing it ever since I became mayor, and uh, I can tell you right off the bat that things keep getting better and better in Westlake, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to serve this community. But it doesn't come without a lot of um, hard work and um, a lot of good things that have happened to the city of Westlake over the years. Uh, like any organization, we have a mission uh, in the city. The mission of the city of Westlake, uh, myself and the city council and all the employees, is to enhance the quality of life for all residents by providing the highest level of services in an efficient and cost-effective manner. Obviously, that last phrase uh, means a lot because it's easy to provide quality services, but if you're not doing it in the right manner and trying to maximize the use of the resources you have, you're probably not doing your job as well as you could. We have a lot of things uh, to talk about why the city of Westlake has been very successful. And I usually point out by listing a number of the reasons why people give to me and also I hear from other citizens and people that choose to move into Westlake. Here are many of the reasons why people choose Westlake as their particular place to raise a family and to live and in many cases even to work. We've had a good history of planning. This community didn't happen by accident. We actually started out with a master plan way back in the 60s and then as city council evolved and things evolved as far as people wanting to move into the city, it's been adjusted. But for the most part, we stuck to the plan. And the main focus was to have a community that wasn't strictly a bedroom community, it was a residential community. And our definition of a residential community is one that the majority of zoning in the community is residential. But in order to have a good, solid, strong base, you have to have businesses, you have to have 
retail establishments uh, in order to have a diverse economic base. And that's one of the keys to the reason why the city of Westlake is generally better off financially than most other communities uh, around us. But what else are people looking for? They're looking for excellent schools. It's a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, my children started in the Westlake schools and I can honestly say to this day, Westlake schools have continued to improve, continue to be a school of excellence and people want to move into a community that, have a, that has a very good school system. We have that. We also have a great library. We also have a pretty darn good location. We have great housing um, choices for people. Uh, we have a good environment that's continually growing. It's not a stagnant community, which also indicates a vibrant community, one that people really want to choose to make it their home. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but um, I tried. I did say I was going to try to abbreviate it abbreviated a little bit, but we have a good partnership with businesses and we're very supportive uh, by our citizenry and our constituents. Obviously sometimes uh, when we ask for things they don't give it to us right away, but I think if we continue to provide them with the appropriate information, they come back. And having been here for 30 some years in public service, that's what it takes. Sometimes you're not getting all the information out, but we've always had a supportive community. Uh, city, and I'm sure the schools feel the same way, had a good uh, group of employees, a good group of people that work together to meet the needs of this community. And now we can say that we have a world-class town center at Crocker Park. And when I first came out here, believe it or not, downtown, for those of you who might know where the little shopping center is at uh, Dover Center and Westwood. That was the downtown of Westlake some 30 years ago. That's what we had. These are, I'm just going to let you take a look at that. As I said, we're a vibrant community. We continue to have expansion of existing buildings. I mean, existing businesses, uh, but there are also new buildings and new businesses that come into town and uh, people expand. These are just a sample of what's occurred during the last year alone, just 2015. Here's some additional um, businesses that have expanded or improved or have come to town. 2016, uh, for those of you that have been to Crocker Park, uh, you saw the opening of uh, Bonefish Grill, and there's going to be 318 new apartments in that particular area at Crocker Park. Here's a couple of the new uh, facilities that were built in 2015. Holiday Inn Express isn't um, open yet, but I can tell you I've already heard from um, these three hotels, Holiday Inn Express, Double Tree, and the Hyatt Place. They're all booked up for the RNC already. These are some of the um, programs that we offer. Uh, when we're in a competitive situation, we don't try to uh, put that out there because we like to think that businesses move to Westlake simply because of the fact that we have a great environment and great quality of life. But in many cases, I shouldn't say in many because in the 30 years, there's only been 10 businesses that we've offered incentives to. And we usually try to make sure that the schools are made whole when we offer incentives, whether it's tax abatement or uh, this tax increment financing. We try to make sure that the uh, school system is kept whole, even if we as a city have to make up the, the uh, tax that might be lost as a result of some incentives. This is just a sample of what's gone on in 2015, how many different um, new homes we had, 23, but the value was 12.6 million. And then we've had uh, over 347 permits with an estimated cost of $89.1 million um, of value uh, in the commercial area. And that's again, just 2015. 
These are some of the programs that we're working on throughout the city. I'm sure all of you have, have recognized that um, we're replacing every traffic signal in the entire community. We're doing that to improve the traffic flow through the community and also to give our police the ability to actually see with the cameras and the technology in those um, traffic lights what's going on at an intersection from the police department. Uh, we also continue to address infrastructure each and every year. This is something that uh, in many cases were unique and we started this over 30 years ago. We take a certain amount of the income tax that the city receives and we set it specifically aside for infrastructure. And the people of Westlake voted on that specifically. And originally I was thinking, and this is where I've had to learn over the years, this should be permanent because we're always going to need infrastructure improvements. Well, the first time it went on the ballot, people said no. And I asked them why, and they said, well, you listed so many projects, but what happens when you're done? And I said, well, it's going to take us 15 years. And they said, well, then come back to us in 15 years and see if we'll renew it. So we did it. We put it on for 15 years. We promised many infrastructure improvements. We actually carried them out. 15 years later, it passed again. So sometimes we have to work to um, set aside money so that it's for a specific use. Um, 2016, we're gonna spend uh, probably about $8 million on infrastructure improvements. Biggest one is going to be at Canterbury in Detroit. And we're gonna put in a new water line on Bradley Road, redo that. We're gonna resurface all of Detroit Road. Um, and we're working on some additional improvements down the road. Uh, we won't get to those uh, Canterbury and Center Ridge this year, or I-90 is gonna be re reconstructed, redesigned, I should say, to make it a more efficient uh, interchange uh, intersection. Obviously, you're not going to have a good community without good safety forces, and I've always said this, we've been very proud of the safety forces that we have in the city of Westlake. These are just some of the things that they do throughout the year, in addition to making sure they enforce the traffic code and, and um, make sure that our community is safe. Here's a sample of what uh, has transpired from 2014 to 2015, the different types of calls, and then the the uh, other things that the police are involved in. Fire department, we have pretty much the best equipment that you can have within each one of those paramedic squads. Um, they can communicate with the hospital, uh, what's going on with the patient before they even get there now, based on the uh, information and the computers that we have in the um, squads, so it tends to help out uh, when you're possibly trying to save someone's life or making sure that the hospital is ready for transport. Again, the calls continue to go up, and here's some other things that they do. Service department is a big, uh, important aspect of any city as well. Uh, obviously, they have many responsibilities, keeping the roads uh, safe, uh, making sure that snow is removed. Uh, we actually have the uh, rubbish collection picked up by an outside uh, firm at this point. We used to have our service department do it, but when that was being done, they couldn't do many of the other projects that they're now able to do because we have an outside firm that does that. Uh, same thing with our parks. Again, statistics. Community Services Department, believe it or not, we do have people in the uh, city that are in need of assistance. Sometimes it's food, sometimes it's uh, um, help with um, paying some bills, and uh, sometimes it's just because someone lost a job, other times it's because we have had some seniors that have lived here all their life and they're on a fixed income. So we continue to provide that uh, type of service where we can, in addition to what they might qualify for the county. 
But um, those services continue to grow, and most importantly, I think transportation is the largest need uh, for the seniors um, as they um, grow older. Uh, so that takes up a lot of our time <clears throat> and um, the number of trips that we provide throughout the year. Now we are going to plan to be on the ballot uh, this November. We're going to ask that the citizens extend an existing one-eighth of one percent of our income tax. Uh, currently, uh, over the last 20-some years, that one-eighth of one percent has been designated specifically to pay off the recreation center. The recreation center was built with that one-eighth of one percent. Um, we're going to ask now that it's coming uh, to the point that it's, it will be paid off. Uh, we've done a master plan for the city of Westlake uh, with respect to additional uh, recreational needs in the future. Obviously, if it doesn't pass, we won't go forward with many of those. But we're going to um, provide additional trails throughout the community, some expansion of uh, Clay Park, which is now we uh, have Peterson Pool there. It's more of a pool. It's not really in a, a family. It's not, it doesn't contain all the new things that more communities nowadays are putting into a family aquatic, aquatic center. We're going to try to um, put that in. Um, and then we're going to also take a look at expanding uh, or building a brand new um, community center. But that will de be dependent on whether or not the citizens uh, decide to renew the um, existing one eighth, one eighth of one percent. Again, statistics uh, with respect to visits and members at the Recreation uh, Center and Department. I know you can't make everything out on here, but um, we have uh, this on our website as well, but there's a number of different features if this uh, Family Aquatic Center goes forward. The next is just how we communicate with the residents. Um, believe it or not, we have our own radio station. Obviously, uh, it puts out information strictly as it relates to the city of Westlake. And if there's something that uh, someone wants included that makes sense, we'll include that as well. And we have the cable channel just like the schools do. Has anyone used the, the uh, signed up for our Nixle texting service? Great. It's another way that when something happens, even if it's a road closed or a specific emergency, we can send that right out. And we are in the process of launching a new website this year. Okay, here's just an indication of what's happened with our valuation when it comes to uh, all the property in the city of Westlake, we are, the property in Westlake is valued at $1,426,427,000. And it shows you what's happened over the last uh, four years. The next chart uh, is how our millage is broken down and what's happened uh, since 1985. Uh, from the city's perspective, we were able to reduce the millage rate uh, from what was 12.9 when I was first elected now to 9.52. Um, so it's about a 26% decrease. Well, the residential rates, uh, how do we compare with neighboring communities with respect to property taxes? And one of the reasons our millage rate is lower than most of these other communities is because of what I pointed out earlier, that there's $1.4 billion worth of value within the city's real estate. So one mill in Westlake 
raises a whole lot more money than maybe 10 mills in another community. Okay, this, this chart indicates the differential. When I said we had income tax set aside for specific purposes, the red line represents 1% income tax. Okay, and that's what's used generally for our general fund revenue. The differential between the, the uh, red and the blue are those dollars that are designated for specific purposes. Obviously, the one-eighth of one percent that I was talking about that I'm going to ask to be renewed is included in that, and also the three-eighths of a percent that's used to replace and repair the roads, the water lines, the storm lines. So this is that tax that I said was in place for 15 years, and then I had to go back to the citizens afterwards and ask that to be renewed. And even at 1.5% tax, city tax, we're still one of the lowest in all of Cuyahoga County. Most are already at 2%, some are at 2 and a quarter, some are at 2 and a half. We're still at 1.5%. Then we've also done a quick comparison as to what our sewer rates are. Uh, we're part of a Rocky River treatment plant. That's where most of our affluent goes. And per quarter, we only uh, bill our residents. Um, well, this is the commercial rate. They're billed on based on uh, usage and flow. But our residential rate is the next one. That's $40 every quarter and look how, look how that compares to other communities all around us. Here's a sample of what's happened over the last four years with respect to our revenues and our expenditures. Obviously I wouldn't um, um, handle it any other way as a CPA and an accountant. I never want to spend more money than we're taking in. So if for some reason we're on a on a trajectory of spending more money, we start adjusting mid-year. And also when it comes to anticipating our budget, we're pretty conservative with respect to what's anticipated. Um, and generally we end up receiving a few more um, dollars than we an actually anticipate. And the reason is because you don't know what's gonna happen. But in addition, if you're not aware, the city of Westlake is one of the few communities in the state of Ohio and was one of the first communities in the state of Ohio to have a AAA bond rating. It took me 10 years with the help of everyone else in the city and my administration and the council and everyone else to set up policies to make sure that we could improve our bond rating over the years. One of the criteria is that we have three months carryover or a 90-day reserve in our general fund at all times. And we try never to go below that because you don't know what type of expenditures you might incur and you need to be able to address those. And that's a good financial policy that all the rating agencies love to see in communities. And all I can tell you is what happened at Crocker Park last week, if that were to have happened in a roadway or something and, it, and uh, we had total responsibility for that, you've got to be able to fix that road if there's a water break that basically undermines the entire road. And if you don't have some dollars set aside, you're not going to be able to address that. And, and if the economy takes a turn, you still got to make payroll. You still got to be able to, to meet the demands uh, of your labor force. So we do not spend more money than we're taking in. And if we have some additional reserves set aside that's more than the three months, we will go into that to address a capital need that we may have wanted to do and we couldn't do it at a previous time. Now this sort of just tells you where the um, dollars come from. 
As you can see, the property tax uh, that we received, we received simply because our portion is only about 14% of property tax. The rest of ours comes from the income tax and these other small portions. This shows you where most of our dollars are spent. Obviously, police and service, as they should be, are the highest um, cost to the city. Like I said, if you don't have a safe community, you're not going to have a very good community either. Uh, and with all the different needs that our service departments have to fulfill, uh, that usually comes in second. Uh, but um, that's where most of our dollars are spent. This is, um, when you break down our general fund expenditures, uh, the salaries and the benefits tend to be the largest cost. But even when you add those two together, uh, we're 60-some 60, 60 percent of our total revenues go towards um, salaries and benefits. This sort of gives you some indication what the population was in 1986, 19,000, um, 2015, we're 32.7. Uh, the blue chart, or the blue uh, lines represent the debt service. Uh, the red line represents our bear balance. Um, and uh, as I said in our in previous uh, State of the City, we're pretty much debt free. We have debt out there, but we could pay it off if we need to. But like anyone, if you've got a low mortgage rate, you're going to pay it off as the payments are due. But if for some reason we had to, we could pay it off early. <clears throat> we are continuing to look at um, another supplier of water. For those that may not be aware, we were successful uh, in our court case with the city of Cleveland. Uh, my purpose was to make sure that we were not, uh, we, all, we had more than one water supplier. And uh, this came up about five years ago when Avon Lake approached us and said, uh, we'd be happy to sell you water, and if we sold you water, you could save uh, many dollars uh, in cost of replacing water lines, as well as the residents would be able to save money. And then any uh, differential between the cost of buying water and what we would charge the citizens of Westlake could be used to replace water lines rather than going into our infrastructure fund, which we have had to do in the last 15 years. We've probably spent $15 million of money that could have been used for roads and other types of infrastructure because when we decide that we're going to replace a roadway, and the water line underneath it is bad, we don't want to put a brand new road over a bad water line. The problem is with our existing contract with the city of Cleveland, as is with most other cities, they only patch it. They will not replace the line. So it doesn't make any sense to us, at least it hasn't for the last 15 or so years, that we're going to replace roads over a bad water line. So we now have options. Again, this is what is represented by the American Greetings uh, expansion. It's almost 600,000 square feet of uh, new office space with another 60,000 uh, retail on the ground level. You've got uh, four new parking garages. Uh, you've got the 316 apartments that I was talking about. And then you've got the additional hotel and um, restaurants. We've also taken a look at the lean philosophy. We know we provide good services in the city of Westlake, but we always want to look at trying to provide those services more efficiently and more effectively. So we all had a seminar, all my department heads had a seminar. We brought somebody in to explain us the process of the lean approach. Some people call it Sigma Six, but what it is is taking a look at 
what services or what product or what um, process that you use in providing a service. And you go through the whole process and you try to look at ways in which you can do it better and more efficiently. So we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to um, provide the quality services and trying to maximize the use of our existing resources. Obviously, when I talk about the capital projects, we review that every year and update it as need be. We were looking at a uh, West Shore Fire District. Uh, it takes a lot of cooperation and a lot of buy-in from the surrounding communities. We're not there yet, so I'm not quite as optimistic about that as I was uh, some time ago. But we'll keep working at it. We have a centralized dispatch center that works very well at the hospital. And everyone says that that has saved lots of um, time of highly trained firefighter paramedics because we have civilians doing that. Uh, these are some of the financial awards, and I know the schools has received many of, of the same type of awards. Uh, but here's just a summary of the our AAA bond rating and the different budget presentations. 18 years in a row we received it, 32 years in a row of excellence in financial reporting. Uh, awards for outstanding achievement in popular reporting. That's the yearly report that I put out um, with our finance department every year that gives the citizens a quick summary of the dollars coming in, the dollars coming out, and what the projects are going forward. And then we received uh, the Auditor State Awards uh, for Financial Excellence and Awards of Distinction for 16 years. So I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I uh, hope you found this interesting and um, informative. Uh, but we couldn't do this as, as a city without the de dedicated staff that I have at the city without the cooperation of our um, city council uh, and the continued support, even though it has to always continue to be earned of our community. Uh, we have, as I said, we have great schools, we have a great library, and we have uh, good employers. Uh, and I think that we're gonna continue to move forward uh, with a great community as long as we work cooperatively and we work together and we address the needs of our community. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you again, Mayor Clough. The opportunities to, you know, to have the discussions that we've had over the last two years, year and a half, uh, the opportunity to talk about future, about partnerships, very important. Westlake as a city is certainly a key part, of, is the key of everything around us, and we are glad to be a, a partner in everything that goes on. And, and thank you again for the, for the work together that we have and continue to have. Going through our state of the schools, uh, sort of focusing on, on some things from a little different approach. We're going to talk about the who and what, which is teaching and learning. We're gonna talk about the how we go about our business as a school district, the finances, where those occur, our facilities, and then what's coming next for us as a district as well. Ran across this chart, uh, and I think it really summarizes the change that is going on in education as a whole. Uh, I'm not really the most keen supporter of 20th century versus 21st century, and as we talk about you know, the importance of 21st century education here 16 years into the 21st century. But I think this taught, this gives us perspective of the change in a generation as to what's gone on in education. In the 20th century, the focus was teaching efficiency. The focus now is on learning effectiveness. In the 20th century, we worried about producing workers for the industrial age. Buildings were built in squares, in blocks, in what's sometimes referred to as the bells and cells model, where you had, where the bell rang and the students moved out of one cell or classroom and walked to the next. And it was very industrial motivated and driven. In the 21st century, we're looking at producing citizens for the technology age. 20th century focus was the teacher as the source of all information. The teacher directed the knowledge. 21st century shifts that to the teacher as a guide. 
more of a student direction almost. 20th century learning, students worked alone. It was one kid, it was competitive. It was almost the scarcity mentality in the providing of, of learning and there was so much learning to go about and if the kids grabbed it, great for them and the others who didn't, you know, it was survival of the fittest. In the 21st century, that shifted to a collaborative learning approach where we try to bring everyone along and do that working together. At Westlake Schools, we're proud of our rigorous academic programs. Our highly qualified teachers in our district average 16 years of experience, master's degrees held by 82% of our staff. That rate is the third highest in Ohio in the last data we researched. Continuing that concept, we have four unique academic programs in four, our four elementary buildings and our high school are all international baccalaureate schools or host an international baccalaureate program. Our gifted program has received a number one in Ohio ranking. 35% of our seniors sit for AP exams in 21 different courses. 97% of our students go on to attend college. World language instruction begins in Westlake schools at the first grade. We have excellence beyond the classroom. At our high school, we have over 45 clubs and activities involving approximately 90% of our students in one of those clubs or activities at the high school. That's a phenomenal participation rate. It isn't just what we do in the classroom that makes Westlake special. That is a key part of it, but it's also what goes on beyond the classroom in those clubs and teams and activities. Our middle school has over 20 clubs and activities and teams. Our choir, orchestra, and band, once again hosted here, were rated as superior in our OMEA district juried competition and will be headed to state. Westlake High School class of 2015 logged more than 20,000 hours of community service as part of our requirements for graduation. They make a difference beyond the classroom. The next part of what we do will be our finances, and for that I'll turn over to our CFO, Mark Papera. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. Um, just have a few slides I want to share with you this evening as we uh, present the state of the schools and uh, specifically more in the area that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the finances of the district. Um, you know, this slide I'd like to show, I showed it in a presentation a while back, and, and um, the Board of Education, uh, as well as the administration, really the, the, the main fiscal responsibilities for those individuals are to really scrutinize the expenditures of the district, make sure they're aligned to our continuous improvement plan, which we're currently in the process of actually uh, updating. Um, we have a strategic process to do that. Um, but to make sure those expenditures that are basically in our budget are aligned to that plan. And that's a critical piece um, to make sure we're staying on our course. Um, Sometimes people will ask me, well, you know, we see a budget, uh, we see a financial forecast. Why don't those numbers match? Um, and really the budget for the school district is really the document that says how we're going to address our needs for the year. Um, Many of you are familiar with your home budgets, very similar process. That doesn't necessarily equal the financial forecast because the financial forecast is actually sort of the roadmap uh, from a financial perspective for our district. It's a critical document uh, that the school board, uh, the administration, and even the school community uses to sort of guide that long-term vision of the district from a financial perspective. We talk about a little bit about our mission here and our vision in this district, and we know it centers around excellence. And excellence is what we all strive for. And that, that stems to every department in this school district. It's not only from the classroom, but whether it's our drivers driving the bus, whether it's my staff in the, in the treasurer's office, or it's our cafeteria workers. We all strive for excellence in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, some things I like to point out, as the mayor suggested, we have some similar uh, awards that have uh, been received in the district, but 
The reason I bring up these awards is not to necessarily boast about the district, although I think it is a good thing um, that we need to celebrate our successes, but really these awards signify there's an external agency um, that can actually validate our school district's finances and how we operate in that environment. And I think that's very important for our constituents. So it's not just me standing up telling uh, individuals, trust me, these are the numbers. These are external uh, validations. So we've, we've received numerous accommodations from the Auditor of State, and I don't want to belittle that award it, it, just as much as the city received that award as well. It, it takes a very high level of cooperation from our district as a whole to achieve that award. Um, you know, even if the treasurer's office officiate, uh, operated uh, with 100% efficiency, um, we still would not achieve this award. It really does take a whole district to achieve this type of award. We've received certificate of uh, achievement of financial reporting from the national agencies of the government finance officers. Uh, I think we're going on 18, 19 years running. We've received designations from the rating agencies, as the mayor discussed, very similar with the city. The city has the highest rating, a AAA rating. From a school district perspective, we also are rated by rating agencies because we also issue debt. And based upon our financials, the way we operate our schools, how our board governs our district, and how, our, how we project our finances, we are rated really the highest rating this district could be rated. Um, there is a possibility for school districts to be rated AAA, but I believe that only exists in one or two districts. Um, and that's where they have cash balances typically exceeding their annual uh, revenue that they bring in. So it's very hard, it would be very difficult to achieve that. Um, but from, from our standpoint, we are at the highest rating and we should be proud of that. So it's basically the top four or five percent in the state. Just a few slides here that show us a little bit where our revenues come from and where our expenditures come from. Um, if you've heard me speak before, it's no surprises that really our, our sort of bread and butter from a revenue standpoint, um, we obtain from our constituents here in Westlake. We rely heavily on our taxpayers here in Westlake, both business and residential, to provide support for our schools. It's almost 80% of the revenue we generate each year. Uh, a lot of times we talk about state revenue and state cuts. That represents about 7 to 8% of our revenue. Um, and then there are some reimbursements from the state that represent about 12%. All the other revenues are relatively small in nature. From an expenditure standpoint, um, no surprise that most of our expenses are in the people we employ. Um, we are a very service-oriented uh, agency. Our business is to educate students. Without qualified teachers, qualified individuals that work at this school district to provide those services for students, whether they're getting to school, to feed them each day, or to just handle the operations, that, that's a major part of our business and, and really a majority of what we do. So it's no surprise that approximately 80%, um, which is very similar to other school districts in the state of Ohio, we spend our, our, our money on people who educate our students. Next chart is really just a graphical representation of the fiscal forecast. As many of you know, uh, the school district for many years, even before it was mandated by the state, has provided a fiscal forecast. Um, and that kind of keeps us on the straight and narrow so when the board or the administration are making major decisions for the school district, this for this document helps to guide those decisions, especially from a long-term nature. The first sort of, uh, first sort of three years in, in this document show actual expenditures, and then all the years to the right, basically from fiscal year 16, which is the current school year, to the right are all projections. Um, as you can see, the, the, the red line represents the expenditures in the district, and the, the black line represents our uh, revenues in the district. Um, it is no surprise, and we've been discussing this, um, at, uh, we've had several operating levy attempts uh, in the past recent years to address this issue, but um, our expenses are outpacing our revenues. So basically what that means is the school district is using any reserve funds they have to offset uh, or to compensate 
for our expenditures that uh, we need to provide in order to uh, sustain a program here in Westlake. Um, basically, uh, this next slide attempts to talk a little bit about how we've managed as a district dating back since our last operating levy, which was back in 2006. Um, it's no surprise uh, um, here, we've been talking about this for a while, but what I, what I attempt to do with this slide is, a lot of folks don't understand that in addition to a lot of the challenges we face as a school district, just from an operational standpoint, things being handed down, whether they're federal or state mandates, whether it's regard to testing or how we operate uh, or some of the bureaucracies we deal with because um, typically those mandates are unfunded. The other thing that's really impacted us from a school perspective is lost revenue that we used to receive. So basically what this, what this graph attempts to show is in the red shaded area, since uh, the year 2006, the school district has lost a cumulative amount of about $18 million from the state of Ohio. And these were monies that were either phased out over time due to policy changes at the state level or, or legislated uh, by certain laws. And so it's a significant amount of revenue. So in addition to some of the, the hurdles and struggles um, uh, we are challenged with each year, whether it's additional testing we're required to do for our students, uh, replacement and maintenance and upkeep of our, our buildings and our facilities, um, and training our staff, we've had to deal with this issue as well. So in the gray, the gray bars represent the revenue of the district since 2006. And as you would see in the forecast, our revenue pattern has remained relatively constant. No surprise when you refer back to that, that first slide that sort of showed where our revenue comes from. Where you will see our revenue spike is typically in those years where we've passed additional operating levies. Beyond that, the other, other revenues we receive are relatively small in nature, so they really don't materially impact our revenue stream. So our revenue is relatively flat, but you can see that over time, those changes down at the state level and the, and the funding we've lost has increased. So in addition to some of those expenses I've talked about before eating into our reserve balances, this has all also impacted us as well. So it's sort of a two-pronged approach we're being challenged with, if you will. So you might ask yourself, okay, so, so what have you done in the past to reduce costs? And these are just some of the highlights. There are several things. We could have a, an exhaustive list here, but I tried to bring out some of the, the major uh, things that we've done in the past and, and the board's initiated um, since some of these operational issues we've been facing. Um, we've reduced staffing here in this district um, by about 13 teaching positions um, would be the, the major reduction. Most of that have, has been done through attrition. Um, and, you know, we value our staff here. The community expects a strong program, and I know that the board supports that mission of excellence, and so that was the, the best way to accomplish that mission. Um, through some of our labor agreements, the past two and a half, three years, we've saved approximately $2.3 million um, in um, those agreements that will span over, over four, a four-year period. We've instituted what's called a spousal mandate for our employees, which basically is something that the private sector has actually been uh, really thrusting upon public agencies for years. Um, and schools were sort of late to the game to, to get to that uh, arena. But basically what we do is our employees, their spouses that have insurance available to them at their place of employment, we require our employees' spouses to pick up that insurance. So we don't, we're not kicking our spouses off, or we're not kicking our employees off our insurance plan or their families, but we're basically saying, if you're offered insurance at your place of employment, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and, and so we've saved over $1.2 million to date. We first enacted that back in the 2006 year. Um, we've done some energy conservation projects that saved us uh, approximately $33,000 a year on a going forward basis. Um, we've obtained grants for our STEM, our International Baccalaureate programs, 
uh, school security arrangements, and our, even our transportation fleet. Our administration pay schedule, we actually reduced, uh, several years ago, reduced our pay schedule for incoming individuals we've hired in the district, and we've hired quite a number since that time by 5%. Um, just this year alone, that saved the district about $60,000. And again, we've had a lot of turnover in that area in, in the last several years. But as you can see, it's made, it's made a little impact um, in reductions uh, to our expenditures. From a consortium standpoint, we belong to every consortium probably known to man for everything we purchase. Um, the biggest would be health insurance. And we've saved millions of dollars just by belonging to that health consortium. But we also belong to consortiums for a lot of the other supplies, equipment, even our school buses that or vehicles we purchase. Uh, we've, we've participated in many, as many that are efficient, the cost service or uh, shared service arrangements. We've shared service for cafeteria supervision. We've shared services for transportation. And we continue to look for additional ways to share services, whether it be with other districts or using our educational resource center uh, located here in Cuyahoga County. The last thing, and I know I intentionally skipped that because I'll have a slide that will address that, will be um, we, we look to refinance any debt we have. As most of you have done with the current low interest rate environment, and it continues to be low, most of you, um, I would say probably a good majority of you, if you've not only looked at it, you've probably acted on it, you've refinanced your home mortgage because of the low rates. Well, we here in the school district have done the same thing with our debt. Very similar concept. We've issued debt years ago at um, theoretically, a, well, uh, legitimately at a higher interest rate because that was the rate of the times. We have a low interest rate now. We've refinanced that debt and have saved our school district millions in future interest costs. So in 2011, we saved about $570,000. In 2014, one of the most recent financing, we saved over $2.1 million. So it's, it's, it's definitely an opportunity we continue to look at on an annual basis, and as that makes sense, uh, the board is requested to take action on that. With that being said, um, talking a little bit about our debt structure here in the district, besides refinancing our debt, um, we have another opportunity coming up in this um, it, for our school district here uh, this coming year and going into next year. We've talked a little bit about this at the board level. I know we've, we've talked as far back in 2010 with the 2020 committee. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this and most recently with our strategic uh, partnership or, or group as well. But simply, there's a lot of information on this slide, and I know you can't see all the figures, but really what I'm trying to, to show you here is, after this year, the debt service, the amount of money that it will take to service our debt significantly drops. And so the board has been discussing for quite some time this opportunity to potentially address uh, a number of our operational and capital needs. And the reason why this opportunity is important is because we feel we may be able to accomplish this without increasing our constituents taxes and so that is a opportunity that I've been in this district 17 18 years now and we've never really been presented with this opportunity our debt structure has never been in this situation and so we talked about this, we knew this was coming, and we talked about this back in 2010. Matter of fact, the 2020 committee even made some recommendations with taking advantage of this opportunity to the board to help address our phase two uh, needs and issues. And so the board is currently looking at this now, but just the long and short of it would be, we're looking at an arrangement whereby we would ask our constituents to basically renew the taxes they are paying for our debt right now. And because the requirement for our debt is dropping, the difference in what our, our, our uh, constituents are currently paying and what we need to service our current debt, we will use that difference over time to fund our phase two uh, initiative, which still has not been completed, um, but we have a significant um, concept, if you will, or concepts uh, in the works, as well as address a number of our capital needs. 
And that can be addressed in certain ways, and the strategic committees are, are being charged with kind of looking at some of these different concepts. But the important thing to, to realize here is this is a critical opportunity for the citizens of Westlake, and it's coming up here very soon. And so uh, it's just something I, I felt the need to point out, and something we've been discussing over the last few years. And the last slide before I turn it back over to Superintendent Palmer is, I call this the value slide, and I know the mayor uh, talked about this a little bit earlier from a city perspective, but the board is very cognizant, and the district I think has a long history of being very cognizant that there's an expectation of individuals, when I move to Westlake, it's because you have a low tax base, you have a diverse tax base, and there's an expectation that that continues. So here at the district, we're very cognizant of that. And um, just this graph kind of shows, basically, Mayor touched on this a little bit earlier, but this shows from a school district perspective how we stack up to all of our neighbors in Cuyahoga County. Quite a bit of bars there, but as you can see, the bar closest to the bottom, it's about third up from the bottom, is Westlake. Um, and, and it's not only important to show where we um, where we are represented in the county, because I think that's important, but a couple other things to point out. I think you'll agree with we, me, we have a very quality program here, we have an excellent program here. So that's why I like to call this the value slide, um, because I like to show our constituents that we appreciate your support, we count on your support, but we also understand you expect value for your money, and I think this helps to, sh to show that. Um, the other thing this shows that even some of the initiatives the board has placed on the ballot in the past, if you just added those millage figures to, these, to our number here, our relative position in the county would remain the same. And so just wanted to share that with you, and I've shared that with some other audiences in the past because, again, the board is very cognizant of that, and I know they consider that when they're making those sorts of decisions. Um, and that is in the thought process. So with that, I'll turn that over to Superintendent Palmer to continue on. Mark, Mark mentioned uh, the phase two concept, uh, which would be our elementary uh, buildings. The master facilities plan developed in the past started with phase one that was the construction of the high school middle school and then the renovation of the former middle school to become Dover Intermediate. That project in 2010, that bond issue for phase one was eight, funded $84 million worth of construction. What we're looking at in phase two is taking that to the rest of the buildings. Strategic planning has discussed that. We met last year uh, with our 2020 and discussions related to what would the future of those elementary buildings look like? Did we renovate all four where they existed? Did we go to a three building? Did we do some sort of reorganization? Uh, anywhere from four, three, two, one, looking at the discussions. That 2020 group sort of focused on the concept of either a one-site concept or a two-site concept. And that's really where the 2020 group left off in the fall. We then started some discussions focused on discussion with community leaders about what was important in the city. And, and we had a, a professional group, Burgess and Burgess, conducting those interviews. And as they began that discussion, it became apparent that we needed to do a little bit more. We needed to get our message out. We needed some more communication with our community as a whole which led to discussion from there as we looked at our existing continuous improvement plan that was at the end of its life. It was established in 2010, 2011, a little bit of revisiting. That plan needed to be revitalized and revisited also. So we then stepped back and took on a full-fledged strategic planning process. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of my slides, but that gives us some perspective of the, over, the, the big picture. Part of that process is focused on facilities, and we'll talk a little bit about our existing facilities to give a little bit of the, the current state of affairs as to what's going on. Bassett Elementary, I'm not gonna go through all these details. We will have this presentation up on our website if you want you know, to be able to go out and look at to get the details. 
Uh, Mayor, is there any objection if we include your stuff in that with our presentation, your slides? So we'll have the entire presentation, all the slides posted uh, here uh, yet this week, I think, as we should be able to do if I look to someone who's nodding, so that's a good sign. Uh, connections with both sides helps. <laughs> uh, Bassett Elementary is a almost a 42,000 square foot building with a capacity target of 460 students. It was built in 67. We have two modular units there and sitting on about 16 acres, of, just under 16 acres of space. Uh, some access issues, as all of us know, coming into Bassett, there's the uh, back exit through the neighborhood that is not necessarily the most well-received exit as I look at Jim and see a little smile. Uh, so that's Bassett, you know, a lot going on there. As I said, built in 67, had additions in 87 and 98, which is not unusual. Dover Elementary, originally built in 1949, added on to in 1970, about 43,000 square feet. Capacity of about 430 students. Also has a modular, about 14 acres on that site. Um, you know, and I think we all know in, in the grand scheme of our Dover campus, it, it we manage it well, uh, but it is not exactly the best traffic flow all the time around that site. And, and some of our neighbors remind us of that as well. But good parking, good site, a lot going on. You see that our heating air conditioning, it's, you know, it's over 25 years old. There is some air conditioning in the building. Uh, average classroom size, and I skipped over that at, at Bassett. Average classroom size at Bassett is 755 square feet. Average classroom size at Dover is 650. New building standards for, I gave you that slide at the beginning about the differences in 20th century learning versus 21st century learning and you know individual student learning versus cooperative learning with students. That involves movement and, and spaces and tables. Class sizes now in, in, the, in the standards, both state and national, call for elementary and all classroom sizes or the standard classroom size is 900 square feet. So you see that if our classrooms in Dover are 650, we're, we're packing our kids into two-thirds of the space and, and making do in two-thirds of the space of what the standards call for today. Kindergarten spaces, interestingly enough, because of the amount of movement of the students and just time on the floor, et cetera, um, and our lab spaces typically call for, in the high school, labs, the science labs, call for about 1,200 square feet in those. So you see that, you know, talking about the elementary here, 650 square feet. Hilliard Elementary, built in 1954, added on to in 98. 19 classrooms, a modular, 11 acres. Classroom size average is 750 square feet. Uh, not air conditioned, uh, some work done to the electrical not really the best parking. Uh, one of the things on this slide you see is, is the concern of bus loop and, and parent drop-off co-mingle. That in, in the older buildings, as Hilliard is certainly one, that concept of mixing buses and parent drop-off can be a logistical nightmare and often is. And, and in new sites and new planning, you try to create separate zones for that to be occurring where it is not uh, a factor. Holly Lane, originally built in 1961, about 35,000 square feet, also has a modular, and you see that, you know, again, that 755 square foot model. Uh, 12 acres there at Holly Lane, so we have some fields behind. Uh, some of the same issues there, uh, as well as others, although the flow into that site seems to be, you know, seems to work out very well for it's given its uh, shortcomings, I guess is the best way to say that. The other site I'm gonna include just for discussion purposes is our Parkside building. Even though we're not using that as a school building, as we meant most know, we moved our administrative offices in there over winter break, December to January. That building originally built in 1966 is 72,000 square feet about 14 acres of space. And 
the, one of the things I like to mention here, you see that that cla average classroom size is about the same as all except Dover Elementary in that 750 square foot range, except for where they built the addition uh, along the parking lot in that space they built to the new standards, 900 square feet. So those spaces are, are bigger, brighter, uh, and we're, we're providing a lot more educational space for students going on there. Again, HVA system, 25 years old, good parking, <coughs> excuse me. Um, overview, some of the issues, the, the last major roofing update, you know, we all know that last spring, uh, we put a one mil permanent improvement levy on the ballot to try to address some of the existing issues that we have. Uh, here, you see that 1996 was the last major roofing update across our district. The details of some of the slides, if we read through all those, most of our slides are out of warranty or in that stage where we're patching and piecing together. It's not where we call somebody up and say, hey, this roof is leaking and they come out and fix it at no charge. We have interior, exterior issues as older buildings do. Same thing with mechanical. Our building control systems are over 18 years and in many cases, parts are very hard to find and Bob can vouch for that as he sees that. Uh, he uh, and, and the other guys do a magnificent job of, of uh, I think, duct tape and bailing wire is one of their most common purchases, but they do a great job of making things work uh, and keeping things working for us uh, to the best of their abilities and to the best of the equipment's abilities, even more so than their abilities. Uh, Bassett is the only building, elementary building, that's mostly air conditioned and most of our air conditioning in any of the buildings is over 25 years old. 21st, learning, 21st century learning environment, just some of the issues, you know, we have packed infrastructure, technology infrastructure into spaces that wasn't designed to be housing infrastructure. You know, Dave made the comment to me earlier, you know, one of our buildings we've got the art kiln in the same space as we have a, a, a network wiring rack, not necessarily meant to design to be placed together, but those are the spaces where we can fit things. Our electrical service, we continue to, to address, you know, as we talked about, I talked about the 2020 and some of the discussions about facilities. One of the concerns our community has, it just doesn't seem up to Westlake standards has been with the modular units. If we needed to come in and put additions on to replace our modular units in our buildings, we'd be going back also and replacing and you know, wiring you know, electrical circuits and, and doing some major work uh, to get that service upgraded to meet what we have. Technology, or I'm sorry, instruction today requires more electricity than it did when it was a teacher and a book and students sitting in, sitting there with their notebook and, and taking notes. That is, it's a different world in education as I mentioned at the beginning of the slides. I talked about strategic planning. Here's, here's our slide where we talk about it a little bit more. I'm very proud and very, very thankful for the 60 staff and community members who worked, did the work to get us to a draft plan of our strategic plan uh, that will be presented to the board in April at our April work session on the 11th and then hopefully approve and then will be acted upon uh, considered for approval by the board at our April 25th meeting. That group worked over several months in developing the goals and framework or goals and initiatives that are part of that strategic plan. The goals include, or include areas related to curriculum and technology, facilities, finance, community partnerships and communications, and then culture and environment. From here, what will happen is once the board approves this list, we will then be developing, whether they're called task forces or teams or whatever the name they take, will include, will discuss what that structure looks like, but it will in, involve a blending of board, administration, community, staff, 
and probably students as well having some input in that process as I see that going forward, looking at developing the actions or the specific tasks or the steps that we take to achieve the goals that have been set by our strategic planning committee. As I talked to the strategic planning committee in, in the first meeting, this plan is really about reaching out and putting that stake in the ground for our district to move forward to in the future. And, and that stake is nearly placed now. And what the internal teams will be developing are the, or will be planning the course to get back to that stake that's been placed out there. I talked about the consideration of the phase two facilities as a key part of that. <coughs> Related to, you know, right now, as I said, that 2020 group and where things stand, there were some discussions of the one site or two site with the strategic planning committee. It was a very narrow difference in opinions, I, I think it's fair to say, amongst that group of about 60 that had a slight preference, started at 60, not 60 there at every time, uh, 60 coming and going at, at different places. But it was a very narrow difference, just as it was with the 2020 that was meeting last year, and I know some of you spent a lot of time in those 2020 meetings very slightly favoring two sites over a one site concept. And I just want to clarify, I say site because a lot of times when people, we were originally saying one and sometimes it became one building because we know or we talk about school buildings. You know, we're not going to build a three story pre-K four. That was never part of a one site location. It could take any variety of architectural design but having all the students in that one site location. So over time, we've sort of morphed that discussion into one site, meaning everybody's together, or two sites. And those two sites could be, be and could involve discussion or would involve discussion of, is it grade level separation, a K2 location, 3-4 location, for example, or would it be by neighborhood, east, west, north, south, northeast, southwest, whatever that designation is, that communication or those decisions have to be made. And Mark mentioned earlier, there, there are some decisions that aren't made yet, but it is a very un unique opportunity Westlake schools are facing as we look at the opportunity to address, <coughs> address our future needs without necessarily increasing the taxes of our residents where they are. Mayor Clough mentioned a similar concept with the city. You know, the city has the opportunity to extend uh, part of that income tax to, to pay for increases in the rec, uh, some of the rec planning that, that is so important and so critical and really makes Westlake so special. So, you know, we're in very similar situations as we look at that. What the school will be doing in relation to some of the questions that are out there from our strategic plan is there will be a phone survey coming up in, in, the, uh, near, in the spring, in the near future, uh, that as those in strategic planning know will be a statistically valid random sample of taxpayers and, and what they do is they target, they break down the demographics of the city and then target uh, a certain number of calls within each one of those uh, segments of the demographic representation to get a, get a snapshot for our board and for decisions to be made in the future. I squeezed this onto one slide so I didn't add a slide to this, but on May 4th, uh, and I have it the PAC, but it's actually in the rotunda, so I apologize for that. Um, that is near May 4th, we will be having our second annual uh, what we call senior appreciation dinner it's been held many years in the past known as senior delight delights in the winter we moved it to the spring we'll be having some <coughs> some of our student groups performing and inviting our senior citizens in for a day the city helps us with that uh, we're very helpful for their or thankful for their partnership with that and i would be remiss not to mention our kiwanis uh, that also helps us sponsor as we have a kiwanian member or two in the crowd as well, and they help sponsor that. So we are very, very thankful for the support of that uh, 
very nice event. Last, last year was very, very well received. And for that, with that, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I, as I said earlier, the weather didn't, I don't, think, I don't think, helped us bring in the kind of crowd that we were hoping for, but you know, a good chance to share information um, in this setup, and hopefully we can see this sort of, this sort of format continue into the future. Um, before we end, I, I would just say if there are any questions for any, any of us, Mark, uh, the mayor, or myself, we'll try to answer those. Russ, I'm looking at you. <laughs> this is happy time, no questions. We are still considering it, uh, the reason being, um, and, and I can ha have to tell you that there's not unanimity with respect to the city council. Um, we've had experts come in and, and indicate that we could save a million dollars if we put the roundabout in. Uh, some of that relates to the additional right of way that is needed if we go the traditional way. Uh, also, we'd have to put up a traffic signal there uh, from my perspective, if the experts are telling me that uh, it's a safer approach and it moves traffic and we save a million dollars, I'm in favor of it. But I don't have the same um, concurrence with all of city council. We don't know exactly how it's going to move once all the um, employees are in there, but I can tell you, like we do with all of our planning, prior to them moving in, we've hired a traffic engineer to indicate what improvements we should make if we're going to add those uh, number of employees. That was done. It has been done. Now it's just a matter of if everyone's uh, leaving at the same time, we may still have um, some congestion there. However, American Greetings has already indicated that if there is, they're going to stagger their times coming in and coming out. So we expect that it will work. And if it doesn't, we'll go back to the drawing board. Mayor, when you spoke to the chamber, the, the new lights also, you mentioned, I think, earlier that those allowed the city, you know, the police or whatever to see those those adjust based on flow, the timing of the lights also, correct? So the, the new lights will also have some adjustments based on traffic flow at the time to help move traffic through as well. Yes, sir. I guess this would be to the mayor. I was wondering if we'd ever be interested in looking into like free citywide Wi-Fi. I know any time I can save gigabytes and stuff, the district likes it. That's been a discussion for probably about 15 years, but uh, we've never gotten um, a company to come in and give us an a, um, overall cost estimate as to what it might take in order to do that. Um, so it really hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, there have been some major cities like Philadelphia and I um, can't remember the other ones that had an actual company come in and volunteer to allow them to be the first major city with free Wi-Fi. They didn't come to Westlake. I know old, okay. Brooklyn, old Brooklyn's doing it currently. Okay. Is the city is the city itself paying for it? I believe they are, but it's saving the residents. I think forty to sixty dollars a month. Well, there are actually cities that actually own the utility that provides Wi-Fi. We're not one of those. You've got choices, whether it's Time Warner or WOW or AT&T or, you know, DirecTV. We've got lots of choices, but um, other cities don't necessarily have that. It's a good thought, and it has been discussed, but we haven't had someone come forward. Kathy? Yeah. 
same issues. Was there ever consideration about putting those elementary schools in Parkside and moving the administration board of ed building into an elementary school? That would be, that, that's on the table as a, or that site is part of a two site location discussion. So if, if the ultimate decision is to go to two sites, Parkside would, would certainly be one of the locations that would seem to make sense, especially on an east-west breakup. Mrs. Hertzberger. Believe it or not, there are a number of towers in the city already. Uh, most of them are at our public facilities, our fire stations, our police station, the post office, um, I think the hospital. Um, the um, Verizon in particular, uh, it's up to them to come forward with a plan. They have not come forward with a plan um, and there's none, nothing before us. Uh, there was one about a year ago from, I think it was a different company that, maybe it was Verizon, that ultimately um, contacted the hospital and they did put a tower, an antenna on there. Unfortunately, it doesn't cover all the dead spots. They have a number of dead spots. But we will try to encourage them to put um, towers or antennas on public property rather than in the middle of a subdivision in a neighborhood. Uh, but it's up to them to come forward with the um, uh, promulgation plan with respect to how far it reaches. Uh, they have to come forward and justify that. And they've got to make the investment. Um, we've told them a number of times and it's kind of interesting for them to say that it's the city's fault because by law we're not allowed to prohibit cell towers. We can control where they're located uh, based on the study that they provide us. But under federal law, we can't stop them. And that's why we have them, but uh, it's up to the individual um, company to come forward with a plan. Thank you. Any last questions? Seeing or hearing none. Once again, I want to thank you, but I, I want to once again, if we could all give uh, Mayor Clough uh, a big thank you for coming out. I love Sky Zone because it's the most fun. I love Sky Zone because it is the greatest workout. I can jump off the walls and fly with my friends. Most fun. It gets my heart rate pumping. It tones all my muscles. You can burn a thousand calories an hour. Most fun. Greatest workout. Most fun. Greatest workout. Most fun. Greatest workout. Jump into fun and fitness at Sky Zone, the original indoor trampoline park.